will, you might go ahead and mark 2 Corinthians 13.5. I'm going to refer back to that verse uh, quite often. Many of us have insurance companies, uh, and if your insurance companies are like the majority of them, one of the things they require that you do is that you go in for a yearly examination. And usually it's your wife who's telling you to go do it if you're a man, because most of us as guys know we don't, we don't like to do that. We don't like to think about the fact that we might be physically ill or that we might become physically sick. It's just something we don't oftentimes want to deal with. But the insurance company, for some reason, they find this pretty important. The reason they find it important is, is because they believe that if they can, they can ward off the fact that you're physically sick, they can deal with it uh, much quicker, and therefore they can get you healthy again. Well, I began to think about the Bible because the Bible uh, does a very similar thing. The Bible requires us to have regular examinations. Now, it's not for the reason that the doctors would. The doctors are worried about the physical, yet the Bible is worried about our spiritual. That's what the Word of God uh, is continuously trying to get us to dwell on. I began to think about Jeremiah. It, it wasn't just in the New Testament that we have uh, self-examination. We find it also in the Old Testament. And Jeremiah, as he lamented over the fact that Jerusalem had been destroyed, he had gone to the people and he had told them, examine yourselves and turn back to God. Listen to Lamentations 3, 40 and 41. Let us search and try our ways and turn again to the Lord. Let us lift up our heart with our hands unto God in the heavens. You find this throughout the Old Testament. You're going to find it throughout the New Testament. We see the, a very similar situation in the teaching of the proper observance of the Lord's Supper, which we've, we just did here. Paul wrote, wrote that it was a time for us as we took the Lord's Supper to, to examine ourselves. It was a time for us to look at, at who we are, the things that we've done, to make sure that we're in a right relationship with our Lord and Savior. Listen to 1 Corinthians eleven twenty seven through 31. Paul writes, Wherefore, Whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged." Paul goes on and he later challenges the Corinthians that they needed to examine themselves whether they were even in the faith. 2 Corinthians 13, 5. If you have turned there, go ahead. I'd mark that and keep your finger there. We'll, we'll continue to come back. Listen very co closely to what Paul writes to them. He says, Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates. Now, it's interesting when you look here, 2 Corinthians 13, 5, Paul uses the present tense for these Greek verbs, examine and prove. His point was this. This is an ongoing activity. You need to continue to examine. You need to continue to prove. This isn't a one-time thing. There are those in the religious world today that will teach maybe something to the fact of you need to one-time examine yourselves and then except Christ. But as you look at numerous verses throughout the New Testament, what you're going to find is this is an activity that we as Christians ought to be engaged in on a regular basis. Well, this naturally ought to raise some questions for us as Christians. We ought to be asking ourselves, why exactly should I even examine myself? Next, we probably ought to be asking ourselves, if I am going to examine myself, what are the standards going to be that I'm going to use to examine myself? And then we need to ask ourselves, if I'm going to even have some standards, what are the questions that I ought to be asking myself? And so what I want us to do right now is focus a little bit of our time and attention on trying to figure out this, this whole idea of examining ourselves. And let's do that by looking at some of the questions that I just mentioned. First, we ought to be asking ourselves, are we even really in the faith? I'll be honest, this is probably a question that many people would struggle to, to answer or to be able to teach somebody else. But Paul said, notice again, 2 Corinthians 13, 5, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. 
that expression in the faith is, is talking about are you a Christian who's in alignment with God's word? There are many people today who will tell you they are Christians or they are God's people. However, what we understand is, is God has given requirements for those who are his people. There are, there are distinguishing marks for those who are God's people. And so we need to ask ourselves on a regular basis, am I in the faith? Am I remaining faithful to the Lord, to the inspired word that I have that, that tells me how I ought to live as a follower of the Lord? Why would I bring all that up? <clears throat> well, if we're going to understand whether or not we're in the faith, we also have to understand that there's a danger of drifting from the faith, drifting from the truth. You'll hear people day, today say things such as, you know, uh, once you've been saved, you can't fall away. You know, once saved, always saved. And, and anything from that point on, you know, God's grace covers it. You ever heard something like that? I was taught some of that stuff many years before I became a Christian. And yet you go and begin to study the New Testament. And what you'll find, for example, in Hebrews 2, 1 through 4, it's possible to drift away and neglect your salvation. What we understand, Hebrews 3, 12 through 14, is that it's, it is possible to develop a heart of unbelief, of being evil, being involved in evil. However, we go back to 2 Corinthians 13, 5. I told you to keep your finger there. This is what we, we can infer from the passage. It's possible for us to know whether we are righteous in God's sight. Can you imagine how horrible it would be to live and to call ourselves a Christian and to never know whether or not we are righteous in God's sight? We can know. We can go to bed at night, and as we're laying there, we don't have to wonder, if I were to die tonight right now, where would I go? We don't have to wonder that. Because we've been given, we've been given the knowledge in the Scriptures. As a matter of fact, 1 John, <clears throat> he deals with this, this very fact, that, that we as Christians can know. We can know our standing before God. Let me give you a couple of verses. 1 John 2, 3. And hereby we do know that we know Him. Listen, how? If we keep His commandments. How, how do people know that I'm a follower of God? They ought to be able to see it, right? Do I keep His commandments? Do I live the way that He told me to live? Do I treat my, my spouse the way I ought to treat my spouse according to the Bible? Do I treat my children that way? Do I work at my job in such a way that people look at me and say, that person's a little bit different? You want to know if you're a follower of God, 1 John 2, 3? You can know it if you keep his commandments. Listen to 1 John 3, 24. He expands upon the idea. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he hath given us. Now that's going to be taught wrong many different places here's what he's saying and it goes back to first john 2 3 we can know that he abides in us but notice at the beginning of first john 3 24 if we keep his commandments and then when you go down again in first john 3 24 he says by the spirit which he hath given us we keep his commandments which were given by the inspiration of the holy spirit there's no holy spirit in me leading me around telling me to do this or to do that but God's holy word does tell me to do this and to do that and to not do this and to not do that. That's why we have the inspired word. And we can know that we are, we are followers of God when we follow his commandments. You really can't get a whole lot simpler than that. And yet many today struggle with the concept. 1 John 5, 13, he continues on with this, this thought process. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, we we'll have to clear that one up because that one's taught wrong all the time too. That ye may know that ye have eternal life and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. He says it twice as a matter of fact. So he's gone on and told us so far, you can know that you're a follower of God if you keep his commandments. And then he goes on and he says, you know you can, have, you can know that, you, that he abides in you if you keep his commandments. And here he says, you can know that you'll have eternal life if you believe on the name of the Son of God. What he means is, is if you believe on the authority of the Son of God, and that authority is found where? It's found in his written word. This is an actual entire sermon all by itself. <clears throat> but the first question is this, are we in the faith? Let me sum it up like this. You can know if you're in the faith if you know what the faith is. 
The faith is the New Testament. That's how we live. That's how we worship. It's pretty much every single thing that we do. And if you're doing it according to the way that God has told you to do it, you're in the faith. <clears throat> I think that most of us would suggest that there's not a million roads going to heaven. Logically, we can understand that. I, I would suggest that each of us, if, if you've never been here before, you can in your mind right now say, I know a group of people that call themselves Christians, and I know that they do this, and that's not going to get you to heaven. This is kind of how I, how I found my way to becoming a Christian. We need to ask ourselves, are we in the faith? There are a lot of different faiths out there. I drive by a church every day when I come here, and I know what they teach, and I know that a lot of it's not found in the Bible. I tell you time and time again, many will say that <clears throat> the problem is we don't have enough churches. I tell you the problem is we have too many churches. There is only one church, and that offends people. I don't know why. There's only one church found in this Bible. Jesus said he would build his church, and you need to find that church, and you need to understand what that church is because you can't be in the faith unless you know what the faith is and what the church is. We need to ask ourselves then, after we ask that question, are we in the faith? Is Jesus Christ in us? That's a pretty valid question, don't you think, for each of us when we claim to be followers of Jesus Christ? Paul had challenged the Corinthians to consider whether or not Jesus Christ was in them. I'm going to tell you the teaching, and I want you to listen very, very closely how I word this. The teaching that Christ dwells through the Christian is a wonderful thought. Let me, let me say that again very carefully. The idea that Christ dwells through us, that's a wonderful thought. It was promised by Jesus himself, John 14, verses 21 and 23. And it begins the very moment that we've put Christ on in baptism. Again, many people will say that you're in Christ when you do a number of things. I'd always ask for book, chapter, and verse. Some will say you can be in Christ once you've, once you've said a prayer. Some will say that you're, <clears throat> you're in Christ when you've spoken in tongues. The list goes on and on. But I'd encourage you to go back and to look at when somebody's actually in Christ. I'll look at a couple of verses here in a little bit. Galatians 3, 26 and 27 will help you understand when you're in Christ, when you've been baptized into Christ. But let's go back to 2 Corinthians 13, 5. He says, examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates? Well, let me try to explain it a different way. How many of you, and I think I've used this illustration before, but how many of you have ever heard somebody say, you know, I really see a lot of your father in you. I really see a lot of your mother in you. Do they, do they literally see your father in you? Literally? Is he in you? He's not. She's not. The idea is, is that I see the same characteristics in you, the same mannerisms in you, the same behavior in you that I see in your father or that I see in your mother. It's the exact same idea by saying that Christ is in us. How many of you know somebody that literally believes Christ is in them? Literally. Literally in them. How many of you know somebody that believes the Holy Spirit is literally in them? If you believe the Holy Spirit's literally in you, I guess you'd have to believe that Jesus Christ is also literally in you because it's the exact same wording here. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about, do you possess the same characteristics? Do you possess the same mannerisms? Do you look just like this other person? Are you doing the same things? This is confirmed by a comparison of those who have Christ as compared to those who are reprobates. I want you to notice again 2 Corinthians 13, 5. He says, Know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you. Very clearly. I don't see how people can get off on this. He's in us when they can see that we have the exact same attributes. When we do the things that he says. Jesus himself said, why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? Luke 6, 46. That's how people can see that, that he's in us. But I want you to notice very clearly the exceptions. He says, except you be reprobates. Now, that's not a word that we use very often. <clears throat> how many of you can remember your mother calling you a little reprobate? I don't. I was called a few things, but I don't think a reprobate was one of them. You may be wondering, what exactly does that even mean? Well, if you go to the Strong's and you begin to look this word up, you'll find it means that that you are unapproved. It means that you are, by implication, you are rejected, whether it's literally or, or morally. It means you are a, a castaway. 
It means you are, in a sense, unworthy. Listen to Titus 1.16. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient. That's a key word. And unto every good work, reprobate. Well, we've got to ask ourselves, are we in the faith? But then we have to ask ourselves, is Christ in us? And what we understand is, is the only way that He can be in us is when we have the exact same mannerisms, when we're doing the exact same things, when we look just like the example He left for us. And when we're, when we're doing that, he is, He's in us, not literally. Just like the Holy Spirit, not literally. That's not what He's talking about there. Third, you've got to ask yourself, <clears throat> am I disqualified? That ought to be a valid question that each of us ought to be asking every day, on a regular basis. How many of us want to go to heaven? I think all of us do, or we wouldn't be here, right? So we ought to be asking ourselves on a regular basis, am I disqualified? It's been declared in the Scriptures time and time again that Christ is in Christians unless they become, as he says, unapproved or disqualified. You may ask yourself, what exactly does that mean, this, this unapproved or this disqualified well, I, I read from the King James Version quite often. <clears throat> the King James and the ASV use the word reprobates. Use the New American Standard Version. They word it a little differently. They, they talk about failing the test. Um, another version I really like, the modern literal version, they word it this way. It says, test yourselves if you are in the faith. Prove yourselves. Or do you not fully know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you, lest you are unapproved? It literally means not standing the test. In the context, the test is, 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 am I in the faith? Is Christ in me? Am I keeping the laws of the New Testament as a Christian ought to? You know, you begin to think about many of the other religious groups. If, if you grew up in one such as the one I grew up in, <clears throat> this, this isn't what told you what you were told to do on a regular basis. You weren't told to follow this. They had their own book. Maybe you guys have heard of the Catechism. It's the faith I grew up in. And so if you were to ask somebody, what do I do about this? They would say, well, go to the catechism. Well, the problem is, is if you want to be in the faith, I'm talking about the faith in the Bible. The faith in the Bible is governed by the Bible itself. Many faiths today are not governed by, by the Bible. They're governed by their own books. So we have to ask ourselves, if I'm qualified, the only way to be qualified is to be in the faith, and the only way to be qualified is to have Christ in me which is by living the way that he tells me to live. You know, there are many different verses that suggest, and I, I, don't, I don't use the word suggest as in it's optional, but there are many, many verses that suggest to us as Christians that we can indeed fall away from grace. We can choose to leave this grace that's been given to us. Paul warned about falling from grace. Listen to Galatians 5.4. Christ has become of no effect unto you, Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. You ever heard someone say, you can't fall from grace? Can I make it any more clear in Galatians 5, 4? Ye are fallen from grace. The idea that you can fall from grace gives the, the inference that you, you once had grace, right? If you can once have grace and you can also fall away, what we see there very clearly is the idea of free will. That I can choose what I'm going to do. Peter goes on and he warns about the falling from one's own steadfastness. Listen to 2 Peter 3, 17. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing you knew these things before, he's talking about the faith, beware, lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. His point was this. You knew the faith, but you can fall away from it. You can fall not only from grace, but from your own steadfastness in the faith. These are important things to ask ourselves as we're talking about um, through self-examination. Am I a faithful Christian? Jesus described what was going to happen to those who did not bear fruit, those who are not living as faithful Christians. Listen to John 15, 1 and 2. He says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. He goes on just a few verses later in verse 6. If a man abide not in me, he's cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. 
Let me tell you what a lot of people say about these verses. A lot of people say, you know what? All these branches are different religious groups. But all these religious groups, these different branches, they're all Christians. No, that's not right. The Bible teaches there is one church. Here, as he talks about uh, his father being the husbandman, and he talks about the branches that bear not fruit, again, notice in verse 6, and if a man abide not in me, not talking about religious groups here, he's talking about individuals. He's talking about individuals who are not living according to the word of God. And these individuals are not bearing fruit. It's only through self-examination that we would even know if we're bearing fruit, right? And that's important for us as Christians as we look at, at how we live our lives because we have to determine if we really even know ourselves. As Paul calls for this self-examination, he asks them, and, and we talk a lot about Paul, especially as how we're looking through the book of Romans, how Paul is a master at getting you to, to understand what he's, he's wanting you to understand by leading you right into the argument and then asking you a question. Paul calls for them to examine themselves by saying, do you not know yourselves? You know, we can easily fall into this trap of self-deception. What I mean is not knowing ourselves. It happens all the time. Listen to James 1, through 25. He says, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and he goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. We need to know ourselves. James here he says we've got to be doers of the word and not hearers only. How many people today are, are hearers and not doers? I would say that's, that describes the majority of the religious groups out there. They are, they are hearers and not doers. Many of them know the words and yet they don't do it. But James goes on and he says, but whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty. He's talking about the law of Christ. Those that look into this perfect law of liberty, the law that sets you free, and he goes on and says, and continues therein. Those who actually know the law and those who do the law as followers of Christ. He says, this man shall be blessed in his deed. You know, if we do that, we won't be deceived. Think about it. How many of us, uh, if, if we knew the law, if we knew everything about it, how many of us could be faithful that we could be found faithful at the judgment? I'm going to touch on that here in just a second. There's a purpose behind this, as James, James writes. Because the religion of somebody who, who rejects the law of liberty, even though they know it, their religion is worthless. Again, this is going to describe many of the groups around us. James 1, 26, if any man among you seem to be religious, how many of you know somebody who seems to be religious? There are a lot of people that seem to be religious. Sometimes they use the terms spiritual. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Not enough just to know the law. Not enough just to tell somebody that I'm a Christian. I need to do it. Not enough to be just a hearer, but I need to be a doer. And it's only through self-examination that I can even know if I'm one who is living according to the law, knowing myself. So I'm going to tell you there's an extremely great need for us not only to know ourselves, uh, but, to, but to continue to examine, and that leads to this very next question. What standards should we be examining ourselves? It's not by my own wisdom or my own opinions. How many of you here have ever had an opinion of something and found out they were wrong later? Let's be honest. I've done that. You can't simply trust on what we think by ourselves or about ourselves. We can be wrong. Matter of fact, it happens all the time. What we need to understand is we are approved only if the Lord commends us. Listen to 2 Corinthians 10, 18. For not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. And so I may think that I'm right. The question is, is what standard am I using to judge the basis on right or wrong? And again, many people... They don't understand this. They don't understand the process of, of 
of being right in his sight. We're not the final judge, are we? 1 Corinthians 4.4, 4, For I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified? But he that judgeth me is the Lord. I'm going to talk about how we get judged here in just a little bit. We can be wrong in our basic assumptions. Being wrong in our assumptions oftentimes leads to wrong conclusions. And again, you'll probably talk with people. Uh, I'll use the example that I spoke with <clears throat> yesterday. Yesterday I had some people knock on my door, and they wanted to tell me about the kingdom. Anybody ever here ever studied about the kingdom? And they proceeded to tell me that the kingdom came in 1914. Anybody ever heard that? I probably haven't even told you who I'm talking about yet, have I? You know what my question was to them? I said, I find that interesting because all the way from the Old Testament, all the way until Acts chapter 2, we keep seeing the Bible say there's a kingdom coming, there's a kingdom coming. And I said, after Acts chapter 2, from that point all the way to the end of Revelation, the kingdom has existed. I said, so somewhere between Acts chapter 2 and the book of Revelation, a kingdom came into effect. But you told me it started in 1914. Can you give me a verse for that? You know what their answer was? They didn't have one. We need to ask ourselves, what, what are we using as a standard for every single thing that we do and every single thing that we believe? If they were using their Bible, they would have come up with the exact same conclusion I did, and it didn't take me but 10 seconds to tell them that. And they left still believing that there is a kingdom established in 1914. We can be wrong in our basic assumptions, and basic assumptions can lead to, to conclusions uh, not only about ourselves, but about others. Because when they left, they were part of the kingdom, and I was not. What I find interesting is, is I'm part of the kingdom, and they're not. You see what happens when you're not using the correct standard? At one time, Paul actually thought that going out and persecuting the church was pleasing to God. Remember that? Acts 26, 9 through 11. There are many today who think that the way that they live, the things that they believe, and the way that they worship is pleasing to God. It's not. We have to remember there are going to be many people at the judgment, and many of these people, they were going to think that they were pleasing during their lifetime to God, and many of them are going to be surprised. That's not something I take, that's not something I take happiness in. As a matter of fact, that will make each of us want to teach even the harder to those who do not know the gospel. Listen to Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Most of you know this passage. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. And many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out many devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works, and then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye work, ye that work iniquity. So we've got to be very diligent about looking for this standard by which we're going to examine ourselves. It's not going to be by the opinions of men. You know, oftentimes I will tell you here, every time I tell you something, I ought to be giving you a book, chapter, and verse. Because you need to go back and you need to verify it. Because if I, need a if I make a mistake, I need one of you to correct me so that I can be righteous. And at the same point, you need to understand so that you can teach others. We can't compare ourselves with others. We can't trust in, in others' approval. We need to be trusting in a source. You know, for us to begin to compare ourselves to other people is extremely unwise. Listen to 2 Corinthians 10, 12. For we dare not to make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. You know, in reality, the approval of others is a pretty small thing. You know, there are many people who, that's what they strive for. They strive to be approved by somebody else. Here's the problem. You know that the approval of others is really dependent on who we choose to run with? That's especially important for our youth. I think back to some of the people that I used to spend time with when I was younger, and for those of my children looking at me, that's a long, long time ago, right? Their basis of what was okay and what was not okay it wasn't even close to the standard. As a matter of fact, none of us knew what the standard was. And so oftentimes people are they're wrong in both their thoughts and their evaluations, and that may be on what they consider to be wrong or what they consider to be good. 
Let's turn on the news. What kind of things do we see taking place in the society that we, that we live in that the society says is okay, but the Bible says, no, don't do that? And many of your friends or people you know will say, it's not that big of a deal. It is a big deal when you begin to talk about the Bible and what the Bible declares us to do. Many people are wrong in their thoughts and their evaluations. Many of them are going to be surprised on the day of judgment. And let me tell you this, many of them who are religious people, some even members of the church, they're going to be surprised. They're going to be surprised because there's a standard, and we've got to examine ourselves by that standard. We have to try ourselves by the standard of God's Word. Here's the thing. I mentioned earlier that, that we're only approved if we've been commended by the Lord. And I gave you 2 Corinthians 10, 18. For, he, for not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. It doesn't really matter what I myself think. You ever had a religious discussion with somebody where you said, well, yeah, I hear what you say, but you know, when you turn to this verse, it says, and their response is, yeah, I know, but I think. Or, yeah, I know, but my opinion is. Or, yeah, I know, but... Here's the problem. What they're doing when they do that is they're rejecting the source. They're rejecting the standard. It is the Lord who is the ultimate judge. 1 Corinthians 4.4 4, For I know nothing by myself, yet I am not hereby justified, but he that judgeth me is the Lord. I don't judge myself. I can judge myself all I want throughout this life, and I may even judge righteously. But you know what? When I die, am I the judge of myself? Absolutely not. There is one with authority, and there is a standard given to us to live by. 2 Corinthians 5.10 For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Now many would read this verse, and they say this, Oh, I'm going to be judged against my goods and my bads, and so if my goods outweigh my bads, then I might get to go to heaven. Again, no. None of us deserve to go to heaven. We can, by God's grace. But the common idea of if my goods outweigh my bads, that has nothing to do with you going to heaven. I told you time and time again, we have to live by a standard. We will be judged according to that standard. The Lord himself said we're going to be judged by his words. Listen to John 12, 48. And this is very important. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words, that's one group, hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Did you see... Those that reject him, and then he, he goes on and he describes even more, and receiveth not my words. Some choose to, to hear his word and reject it. Others, they don't want anything to do with it. But here's what we find. We're going to be judged, every single person, whether, you're, whether you claim to be a Christian or not, you're going to be judged according to God's word. In essence, this is what he's done. He's given us the answers to the test. He's given us the answers ahead of time. And he's even told us what the test is. The test is you're going to be judged according to my word. And he's given us his word. How many people should actually fail that test? Anybody have a teacher like that in school that gave you all of the answers before you actually took the test? I love those teachers. <laughs> I had a few of those teachers. They would say, here's a study guide. And if you study the study guide, you can get a good grade on it. That's how I got some good grades in school. That's what John 12, 48 says. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Should anybody fail the test? Absolutely not. We got the study guide. We have how many years? Some more than others. To study for the test. All we have to do is study it and know it and then put it into effect. Nobody should fail the test, but here's the sad part. People are going to. People are going to fail the test. You know why? Because they haven't examined themselves. They don't know what the standard is. Many of them, they don't know how to live up to the standard. Let me give you some questions to help you examine yourselves as I draw this to a close. And as my wife said, when I say I'm drawing this to the close, that really means i still got 15 minutes. <clears throat> is Christ really in you? Ask yourself. Have I put him on in baptism? I mentioned this verse earlier. Galatians 3.27 
For as, many as, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Well, that's pretty clear right there, isn't it? For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, that word ace in the Greek, have put on Christ. You've not put on Christ until you've been baptized into Christ. How many people will tell you, man, this is what I was told. I use this as an example because this is what I was told. I told a guy I wanted to be saved, and he said, just say this prayer after me. What prayer? He said, you just repeat what I say. Anybody know where I find that at? But I do find in Galatians 3, 26 and 27 that if I want to be into Christ, I have to be baptized into Christ. Ask yourself if you're here right now, have I been baptized into Christ? Been baptized, as we see in Acts 2, 38, for the remission of sins? Ask yourself if you're keeping His commandments. John 14, 21 he that, hath, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. You know, I've talked with people where, and it's usually a, a topic we don't want to talk about, but you look at some of the things taking place in our society today. And I've had discussions with people where they say, well, I think that's okay. And I say, but the Bible says that that's sinful. And they usually give me this kind of answer of, of, you know, well, Jesus knows that I love him. Jesus knows what's in my heart. Is that what the Bible teaches anywhere? The Bible doesn't teach that Jesus knows that we love him just because we love him. The Bible teaches that Jesus knows we love him when we keep his commandments. I can't say that I love Jesus and then walk out and do whatever I want that rejects his holy word. Does that make any sense? Ask yourself if the marks of discipleship are present in your life. Are you abiding in his word? John 8, 31. Then said Jesus to these Jews, those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. That goes right with what I just looked at about keeping his commandments. You can't be a disciple of Christ and reject his commandments. You can't reject, you can't reject what the Bible teaches. Ask yourself, do you love your brothers and sisters in Christ? John 13, 34, and 35. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. That's not just your brothers and sisters, that's everybody. Are you bearing fruit? John 15, 8. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. That bearing fruit comes in a whole lot of areas. That bearing fruit's not only talking about, about your own personal growth as far as being a Christian, but it's also talking about going out and teaching the gospel to others. Obviously, us being under the Great Commission, that's what we do. We go out and we, we teach and we baptize and we continue to teach. There are a whole lot of other questions that we could we could ask as we're trying to examine ourselves whether or not we're in the faith. But I hope this begins to illustrate the fact that we need to use God's Word so that we can verify that we are approved. I hope that this gets us to understand that we could be considered reprobates. That's a strong word. That we could be considered disqualified. Again, that's a very strong word. Or as the MLV puts it, that we could be considered those who fail the test. And I bring that up. Why would he say that, fail the test, when I just mentioned to you John 12, 48, we know what the test is. And we were given the answers to the test. There isn't one person that ought to fail that test at the judgment. Those that will, will fail it because they didn't examine themselves. And I want you to remember those who were disqualified, those who were reprobates, those who failed the test, because Paul describes them like this, Philippians 3, 18 and 19. For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping. Paul doesn't take pleasure in this. He's crying that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Does that sound like people around us today? They're not worried about spiritual things. They're worried about earthly things. They're worried about money, and they're worried about whatever it is they love to do. They're not worried about what's going to happen to them when they die. But I'll tell you this. 
I've stood at a few bedsides when people were about to die. And they, weren't, they weren't worried about money anymore at all. Some of them scared to death. Go on and remember what, what we see described. Because he describes those who were reprobate, but he goes on. He doesn't just stop there. He paints the full picture. Listen to those described in Philippians 3, 20 and 21. He makes a contrast. He says, For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. If we want to ensure that we're not disqualified or that we're considered reprobates, we need to examine ourselves. We need to examine ourselves according to God's words so that we can be found righteous at the judgment. And as I draw this finally to a close, the only way that you can be found righteous in His sight is simply to be a member of the church that Jesus Christ Himself talks about and that the New Testament describes. In every conversion account in the New Testament, when somebody became a follower of God, you will find that somebody taught them the gospel. Romans 10, 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Nobody comes to the truth without hearing or studying the word of God. And when they've heard it, they believe it. Hebrews eleven six. 6. But without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. He was God in the flesh, and he is a rewarder of those who seek after him. And when they believe that, and understand that Jesus Christ shed his blood so that they could go to heaven, they're going to be more than willing to repent of their sins, just like Jesus said in Luke 13, 3. Nay, I tell you, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. You see the need for examination right there? It's not enough just to repent of your sins. You need to confess the name of Christ, Romans 10, 10. And you need to be baptized by immersion for the remission of sins. Jesus himself, Mark 16, 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. You can't get any clearer than that. You want to be saved? He tells you what to do. And then he says, but if you don't, you're damned. That's what we find in the New Testament. Those people that did that, they were added to the church. You find that in Acts chapter 2. But again, it wasn't enough to just be added to the church, like people teach today of once you're a Christian, it's okay, and you can do whatever. 2 Timothy 4, 7, and 8. Paul was striving for that crown. That requires examination. He had to strive by knowing the law, living faithful to the law, and guess what happens when we mess up? And this brings me some confidence, hopefully you too. You know when I mess up, 1 John 1, 9, I can repent of that, turn from it, turn back to God, guess what, it's gone. I don't carry the baggage around anymore. I am clean again to continue to do God's work according to His will. And if I were to mess up again, again, 1 John 1, 9, I can turn from it and turn back to God. We don't carry the baggage around. But that continues, uh, that continues in us through the requirement of self-examination. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, please don't leave without talking to me. Please let me sit down and study with you and show you what the Bible says. Not what I think, but book, chapter, and verse. And if you're here and you are a Christian and you say, I don't think I've done a very good job examining myself. There are a lot of areas I've fallen short. You can fix that today. And most likely it's a personal issue and you just need to, you need to repent of that privately and deal with it. If you've brought reproach upon yourself publicly, you may need to deal with that publicly. But in either situation, we want to help you. And if we can just help you even spiritually by offering prayer on your behalf, we'd love to do that. In either situation, you can make that known as Brother Joe leads us in a song of invitation.